Um, Paul, you'll have heard me, first of all, going through everything that the European Union has just announced. What are your thoughts on that? You're very welcome, firstly. Uh, but the question is, is it, is it too late? And uh, how quickly can they get these this support to Ukraine? And if these initiatives, which uh, we have, Ukrainians have been asking for, and President Zelensky has been asking for, for for many weeks now, if that was implemented only a week ago, would we have the situation and the and the terrible attacks and invasion that is actually going on right now? So I think it's a lesson learned. So we need to make sure that we act quickly and decisively and uh, and look at more what we can do because the key right now is acting quickly. There's an air war happening and this is where Ukrainians are really at a disadvantage and that is the, the airstrikes, the uh, the airborne units that are being deployed into Ukraine, the missile launches and that's why the third thing that the Ukrainians asked for which, were, which wasn't mentioned in the press conference was the no-fly zone and Ukraine's been asking for uh, the establishment of a no-fly zone to, to allow to stop the, the barrage of, uh, of air strikes and, uh, and air force. But Paul, you'll be well aware of the risks that come with trying to impose a no-fly zone over Ukraine if Russia doesn't concur with that idea. There are risks, of course, but at the end of the day, uh, uh, it's Vladimir Putin that is invaded. It's Vladimir Putin that is that is conducting airstrikes. It's Vladimir Putin that is risk that, that is taking over the Chernobyl nuclear site, and uh, and and those things can potentially pose risks today to the rest of Europe. And that's why we need to stop him now. And that's a decisive measure, something that, quite frankly, he will understand because he only understands when you do stand up with force. And if you do threaten him with an no-fly zone, then that certainly puts a whole different perspective on the situation and we'll then we'll be able the Ukrainians will be able to take back their territory. Well hold on a minute. He may well understand, but he may respond to his understanding of that situation by escalating the conflict still further. Is that really something you want to risk being played out inside Ukraine? He has threatened right now escalating the risk across the globe. Uh, he's made that very clear in his erratic, uh, very irrational statements that he's been making. And I think what we need to do is keep him from taking Ukraine. Because we've seen him take these tactics before where he's taken territory and then used that as an opportunity to continue to expand and expand. The Ukraine has been fighting this war for over eight years now. And uh, this is the strategy that Putin has taken. He, he aggressively takes, sees what kind of pushback he gets, and then he's, they stop in his tracks. This is something that the Ukrainians need. They've been asking for. People are getting killed. Their homes are destroyed. People are living every night in, in, in subway uh, bunkers and in bunkers. And uh, this needs to be stopped. These airstrikes need to be stopped. Can I also ask you about the refugee crisis that's being created? I was just mentioning the European Union is offering uh, particular assistance to its eastern members who are having to take in many people. You're speaking to me from Toronto. Do you think in the longer term we may be in a situation where countries like Canada need to be considering offering support as well. Countries like Canada, the United States, Australia have been offering support. Uh, right now, this is a temporary refugee crisis because when we're seeing, because we're, we're, our communities are around 65 countries around the world, we're working very closely with uh, the Ukrainian communities in Poland, Hungary, Moldova, Romania, and we're hearing from them. In fact, this morning was just uh, on the call with the, the, the communities that are helping these, these refugees. They're standing at the borders with signs and says, I can take two people, I can take five people, and they're taking them into their homes. And they're primarily women and children because the men have stayed behind to fight and uh, these people will be returning back. This is about temporary and, and it's great to see that the international community stand, is, is prepared to support these refugees but we certainly want them to go back to their to their, to their lands because it will be a huge rebuilding of, of Ukraine after this uh, terrible, terrible invasion. And Paul, I've only a minute but I'm imagining you're in touch with an awful lot of people in Ukraine. I am. And they are very, very scared, but they're also very, very resilient. They know that this is a fight for their homes, for their families, but also for their futures. They've been fighting, whether it was during the Orange Revolution in 2004 and 2014 and the Revolution of Dignity. They want to live free. They want to live in a, uh, in, in, a, in a peaceful European country that respects the dignity of its people. They, they want to live in a democratic country. They don't want to live in an oppressive Russian regime. And that's what they're fighting for. They're fighting for their values, and they're very motivated for, uh, into, in, in, that, in that struggle. Paul.